Hi everyone and welcome to this knowledge clip on theories of international migration. Today I will talk about the new economics of labour migration, which became famous at the end of the 80s for explaining why people move particularly out of developing regions uh, and countries. Now, what the new economics of labour migration did differently theoretically compared to earlier theories like the neoclassical theory, push-pull theory or behaviourist approaches is to shift the focus away from individuals making a decision to move away, uh, to move internationally towards households as collective units that decide together um, to send somebody abroad uh, because of a family inversion, namely to make sure that people or families can cope with certain risks that life brings in uh, developing regions in uh, particular where the welfare state is not uh, so developed that whenever anything happens they can get support from the state, for example. And so what Odette Stark particularly, who is one of the main uh, founding fathers of new economics of labour migration, indicated is that people in developing countries, they do not have uh, insurance against many risks. Think about hurricanes that can happen, think about droughts. So many things can happen that destroy your crops, which means that when that happens, if that is your only source of income, you're in trouble you really cannot survive. So what happens is that people try to spread the risks that they have uh, so, um, and anticipate on any eventual um, natural disasters that might already happen and they use migration to do so. Because by sending somebody abroad from your family, you are sure that you get um, some extra money in in any case, when anything happens, that you have an alternative income. So uh, you see income diversification happening and you have uh, a spread of risk by the different families. Now, key to understand um, the new economics of labour migration and why people then make a decision to move internationally is the concept of relative deprivation, which is a concept that Odette Stark uh, took from uh, sociology. And I leave you just for a minute to uh, read the quote on the slide, uh, which explains what relative deprivation is about. So I hope you now had enough time to read uh, the quote that I introduced uh, on the slide, but we will explain this also uh, a little bit further later on. So the idea is that it is rather relative deprivation instead of absolute poverty that really drives people to migrate. And this is something that we really also see when you look at the graph um, here, for example, namely that people who live in regions where there is a very low economic development, where there's a lot of poverty, which are really on the uh, left-hand uh, side of this uh, bar graph, you see that the tendency to emigrate is rather low compared to people who live in middle-income countries because they have more money available to migrate. And that is where the concept of relative deprivation really kicks in, where people start to compare themselves uh, with others. So, there was this uh, sociologist who was called Walter Runkiman, an historical uh, sociologist, who said there's four preconditions for relative deprivation to occur, and this will really help you to explain the core of the concept. So, person A does not have X. What does that mean? Imagine that this is your car, right? Uh, and I also have the very same car. So this is parked, we live next to each other, you are my neighbor, and we both have this car parked in front of our house. So we both have the same, there's uh, nothing uh, to complain about. But then suddenly, you see that I park in Aston Martin one day uh, in front of my car. You think, wow, this is a very nice car. 
where does that come from? And you ask me, like, how did you get that car? And I say, well, uh, you know, I uh, have some family members that I did send abroad. They sent me remittances that allowed me to save some money and that allowed me also to buy that car. But that means that you can feel relatively deprived because I do have something that you do not have. And that is then the second uh, precondition, right? So you know that I have a car, you want to have that car as well, so you feel relatively deprived because you also want an Aston Martin. And then, of course, you also know that obtaining this is realistic because you know that I did send some family members abroad who sent me money, remittances, which allowed me to buy that car. And then you think like, okay, so I will do the same. We also send a family member abroad. And that is how relative deprivation, it's not about comparing yourself to the whole of society. No, it's comparing yourself to people who were next to you, who you know, and you see that through migration, their status changes. That is what leads you as a family also to think about migration as an option to diversify your income, to increase your income, and also maybe to improve your status in the region where you are living. And another example that we can give here comes from Chitwan Valley, where uh, Bandari did a very interesting study. And Chitwan Valley is a valley in uh, Nepal, which was uh, called for a very long time the Valley of the Black Water because there was a lot of malaria. Uh, it was very bad uh, living there. But then there was a malaria eradication program in the 50s, which led to a massive increase in the population of uh, Chitwan Valley namely from uh, around 40,000 inhabitants towards 350,000 uh, inhabitants uh, 40 years later. But important here is that in the community, uh, the villages that uh, are located in Chitwan Valley, your status is based on the number uh, of acres that you have, they call it kata, of land, agricultural land. And the more agricultural land that you have, the more status that you have in the community. And so it's a very good case study because you have 80% of the people living there who really work in agriculture. You have 23.9%, so 24% of households that actually do send individuals away to uh, find work. And then uh, uh, Bandari wondered about, okay, why was that really the case? What drove their migration uh, decision? And then she started to, in, uh, to map, okay, how much kata and how much acres do each family um, possess in uh, the valley? And then she started to look at, and what is the likelihood that then families send somebody abroad? And as you can see eh, on the graph here on my right hand side, is that those who have a lot of land, which are the upper bars, that they are much less likely, because the bar is to the left, they're far less likely to send away people abroad to find work, whereas those who are in the lower bars uh, and who have few land are much more likely to send people abroad, because with more money you can also acquire more land. So here is the principle again of relative deprivation. You look around you, you see there's people with more land, people with more land have more power, I also want to have that, so we send people abroad and that's how the migration process, uh, decision-making process starts to work according to the new economics of labor migration. So this was uh, the knowledge clip on the new economics of labor migration. I hope you enjoyed it.